And then one time I experienced 5-MeO-DMT in a very controlled and curated setting with a very controlled dose that was very pure. And, you know, I can talk all day long about my other experiences, but that 5-MeO experience stands out to me as probably the most profound one of all and immediately coming out of that. So I wow. took I, I took two inhalations, so two doses back to back. So you, you did the one dose and then you had the option of doing the second one. And I and everyone else who did it took that took that option. So I'll put it that way. Um, my eyes were closed on the first one. And I was told at the beginning by the person administering it that um, it was talked about in, in more of an Eastern framework, more of a Buddhist framework. So we were told point blank in a very confident language, this is going to put you in a state of samadhi consciousness. You're not going to have any percepts at all. You're going to, you're going to reach a state that, you know, yogis get after 20 years of meditation, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I was also told that I would reactivate so that in the days following it, I would relive the experience to some extent, probably at night. And going into that, you know, I was sitting there as a neuroscientist and as someone who had tried everything else. And I said, mm, that sounds like bullshit. Mm. Um, I've never, there's no acid flashbacks. That doesn't happen. Um, I appreciated, but didn't maybe appreciate as much as I would the, the, the way it was described in, in Eastern terms. Um, so I immediately came out of the first dose with my eyes closed and there's nothing to report because again, there was no, there was no content to it. It was contentless. Um, it was just void. Um, but as you come out of it back to normal consciousness, you have this very, very deep and visceral sensation of bliss. Like, even though there was nothing to report on, I didn't see anything. There was no, there was no visuals, literally. I just come out of it with this complete state of bliss and, and restfulness in my mind. And I immediately signal with my hands that I want to try the second dose. Like immediately, as soon as I was physically able to do that, I said, yes, let me try that again. And I didn't plan to leave my eyes open the second time, but they were. And I was looking up at a light. And so in contrast to the first experience, which was void of content and complete darkness, this one was the bright white light. You know, in retrospect, as soon as I came out of it and I could think again, I was like, okay, that is every near-death experience and every, you know, every classic description of that type of thing, you know, my life flashed, be flashed before my eyes just before I got into a car accident or just before I went into cardiac arrest. Um, every, you know, if you hear people talk about a very high dose LSD experience, I think that's the, the brain state you get to probably with a high dose of a lot of these substances, but for 5-MeO, hmm. it, it put you there immediately and to an extent that I had not experienced with any other psychedelic before. And I don't have any concrete evidence for this, but phenomenologically, when I look back at a lot of the things that you talk about in your book and a lot of the ways they're described, 5-MeO is the compound that really jumps, jumps to the front of the list for me. I was very interested to see if you would find evidence of any 5-MeO usage in the book. And you know, there's evidence historically, I think, from toads and other things that that maybe maybe it somehow got into some of these concoctions, but um, is probably harder to come by. Wow, I mean, that's a, first of all that that's a phenomenal story. I feel like I have nothing of value to add from here on out. Uh, I could just listen to to stories like that all day, which is a, part of the reason I wrote the book. I love listening to stories like that because you know what you're describing. I mean, is it fair to say that you would consider that a mystical experience? Yeah. I mean, again, I'm not a religious person and there's no need to, to bundle these experiences together with, you know, overt religiosity, um, if, if that's not your cup of tea. But yes, I would. So as a non-religious person, I think anyone that would describe themselves as religious or spiritual would certainly interpret this type of experience in that way. And even if you're not like me, like I... I think it's fair to call it a mystical or spiritual experience because it, you know, it fundamentally alters your state of consciousness. You have no, your ego does die, quote unquote. It obviously comes back. It's reborn, um, as they say, but it puts you into a state that makes you appreciate the ability to just be aware at all much more. Hmm. And don't get me wrong, as I was coming out of the 5MO experience, I did have, you know, absolutely crazy and beautiful, colorful forms. 
I immediately, as I was coming out of it as well, thought about people like Plato and the theory of <laughs> forms. And I had, the, I had the notion in my mind, like, oh, like maybe, you know, my mind went there. I was like, maybe some of those early thinkers describing things like that had something akin to this. This is, of course, before I read your book. So it, it kind of made me dwell on that even more. Mm. But, but yes, I would call it a, a mystical experience. You know, even Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins, he's a straight-laced and rigorous a scientist as you're going to find. You know, he talks about the mystical type experience. And he, he talks about it purely in academic and, and frankly, quantifiable terms as you can. So, so again, these, things, these experiences are powerful. You can describe them as mystical, but I want to make it also clear that, that that doesn't necessarily need to come bundled with, you know, metaphysical claims that are beyond what science can describe. So then I only have one follow-up question, which is because now I'm fascinated given, given your background. Um, you know, it, I, I, I agree. We get lost in, in the, in the, in the jargon. So do you have different, I mean, with all these experiences, maybe perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, climaxing in five MEO DMT, do you think differently about life and death? Do you have, maybe it's too personal. Do you have a, a, an intuition about what, if anything happens when your physical body dies, that that is informed by these experiences? Yes. Um, I think the short answer is yes. The way that I think about that as a scientist, as a neuroscientist in particular, is so let's describe a little bit of what we know about the brain states that one can measure when people take something like psilocybin or a classical psychedelic. Then I'll back into the phenomenology that I described and what I think might happen under a quote unquote natural death. And when I say natural death, I mean you're old. You're lying in bed. You're, you're not getting hit. You're not getting hit by a truck. You are slowly <laughs> right. shutting down due to your body being decrepit. So, what do we know about the brain states of psychedelics? Well, basically, and this was surprising to a lot of people when it started to be observed. Um, you might naturally think, oh, with all the pyrotechnics and hallucinations that you get, there must be all kinds of extra activity happening in the brain. And to some extent, there might be. Um, but a lot of what you observe from EEG recordings and fMRI data, at least in the cortex, the outer wrinkles of the brain, is that things often get quieter. So the, the, the brain is literally becoming quieter. There's less chatter, it seems, in the cerebral cortex. And when you start to think about it from, you know, maybe an Eastern perspective, you know, a meditation master, um, and when you start to actually look at the data, on meditation and neuroscience, the brain states that you see from people in a deep state of meditation are at least on a high level, not unlike the brain states you observe when people are given fairly large doses of psilocybin. So your brain is getting quieter in many ways. And then, you know, when you think about how people talk about these things, you know, the doors, the doors of perception being cleansed, um, you know, the, the, samadhi states of consciousness that are devoid of differentiated perceptions that you hear about in an Eastern religion, et cetera, et cetera, it starts to make a hell of a lot of sense. Your brain is literally getting quieter. That includes especially the regions of the brain that we know are important for your conception of self, your ego, your ability to introspect. So phenomenologically, people experience these states of ego death, and that sounds a little airy-fairy until you experience it yourself. But neurologically, we see exactly, um, we see a pretty good correspondence to the brain states that, that you know, that, that jives with that. Mm. So going back to my 5-MEO description, phenomenologically, it was very much, I've never had a near-death experience, but as soon as I had that experience, I was like, okay, this is, this seems to be exactly what that is. Like, mm. I see the light, everything is blissful, I have this sort of pure, undifferentiated perception and i come out of it with this very prof profound and, and powerful appreciation for being alive at all mm -hmm. so what do i think is going on there well i think these compounds are literally quieting down your brain they're obviously quieting down parts of your brain that do complex things like linguistic thought perception etc cetera, etc cetera. they're clearly not shutting down the rest of your brain, which is good because you survive these experiences. So your brainstem circuitry that's responsible for keeping your heart beating and your lungs filled with air is still going. And that makes a lot of sense because, you know, the more complex cognitive functions of the brain are more expensive, right? That's why they're relatively unique to humans. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that's why those things probably shut down first. So if you start to think about a natural death experience, you know, think by analogy to walking outside in the wintertime with no coat and, and no gloves, your fingertips are going to get cold and your toes are going to get cold and numb way before other parts of your body because, you know, we've evolved to have these built in robustness mechanisms, meaning that your, your body knows keep the heat on your vital organs and shut heat off from the other areas first. Because if you lose a couple of fingers, that's unfortunate, but you'll survive. But if your heart stops beating or your lung stops breathing or your brain shuts off, then the whole, the whole body is over. So there's an order of operations. The things that are absolutely essential are maintained and, and shut off last. So when you think about a natural death, an old person on their deathbed, and you think about, you know, everything's sort of slowly shutting down, your, right, your kidneys are going to shut off before your heart, right? Mm -hmm. And in your brain, there must also, I would, I would expect, be an order of operations. The very metabolically expensive and sophisticated neural networks in your cortex that allow you to speak and do calculus and you know, logically reason are going to shut off before the circuits that are responsible for low-level perception and breathing and vital functions. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a near-death experience or an actual death experience, as those higher order brain areas shut off, but the other ones are still online, you have this quieter brain, you have a lack of normal perception of the ego and subject object distinctions and so forth, but you still have a certain level of quote unquote, pure conscious awareness. And I think psychedelics and meditation practices and things like this simply put you in a state that is not unlike that. Hmm. So that's what I think is going on. And so I think, you know, coming out of those experiences for me, I, I now know, or I appreciate more that when it does come time for my own brain to shut off permanently, um, I know that that can and will be one of the most blissful and important experiences of my life. And in, in those seconds or minutes in between having a fully aware and differentiated state of consciousness and death, you will be in an undifferentiated state meaning you're not having specific perceptions, there is no linguistic thought, and there is no perception of space and time. Hmm. So I'm not saying, right, you live forever, and there's a place that you go that's really fun to hang out, and everyone you knew is there having a great time. But in those moments before you truly expire, there is no sense of time. And while you're in that perception, there's not only no you, there's no center to the experience, but there's also uh, it feels like forever. There's so, no not you either. Right. So there is this, it, it's just interesting to think about in that way. And I, I do quite strongly believe based on the neurological data that we have and the phenomenology of these experiences and the way people describe them, that, you know, when you go into altered states, whether it's with a drug or yoga or whatever, it is I think putting you into a brain state that's not unlike what happens when your body is shutting down. And that's mm. why there is this deep connection between near-death experiences and mortality and spirituality and psychedelics. You would have been quite welcome on the steps of the School of Athens, my friend. <laughs> uh, Plato once wrote that uh, true philosophy is nothing else but the practice of dying and being dead. This, this is why the Greeks were obsessed with thanatology the thanatology. study of the death and, and dying process. I mean, th this has been a whole conversation about thanatology because I mean, what else, what else is there? How do we forget, you know, when you wake up in the morning that you will die someday? I think it's something that should be um, meditated upon um, mm -hmm. every single day. Because I think if you do do that, I mean, you having experienced that, me not having experienced that through 5-MEO, but through other experiences, mm -hmm. which is the conversation I rarely have, but, but clearly I've, I've had my own near-death experiences, which is why I'm really attracted to, to psychedelics and how they imitate that and how they imitate perhaps the natural dying process. To focus on that, to, to study that and to make that the epicenter of your scholarship uh, to me is true ancient philosophy because I think what it does is it connects you back to the real world mm -hmm. um, you know, without having to preoccupy ourselves with the fear of death or, you know, um, or, or being so, I don't know, scared of it in such a way that we have all these unconscious uh, you know, anxieties that, that 
that arise and all these ways that we distract ourselves in life to ever, you know, to prevent ourselves from thinking about immortality. I think to have a, a healthy relationship with death um, puts you in the here and now. 